Thank you very much, Safe. I'm very impressed that you remembered my CV. Um, the history of collecting Islamic art, well, it, it's a huge subject, so I've tried to condense it as far as possible. Um, this is a talk that I first gave, or a version of this talk, um, at Doris Duke's house, Shangri-La, in Honolulu, 20 years ago. And I was commissioned to come out to Honolulu, fly to Hawaii, and I was given an all-expenses-paid trip um, for one week, and it was an, an absolute dream. And um, I've, since I was requested by the British Museum to give the talk, also the v and I gave this talk in Doha, a version of it. And I have adapted it considerably since then because, of course, the market for Islamic art has changed in the last 10 years. The original title of the lecture was Why is there so much Islamic art in Western museums? Or why is there so much Islamic art in the West, not just in museums, but in private collections as well? Why are there so few storehouses of Islamic art in the Muslim world? Where are the treasuries? Where are the royal collections? You will answer me by saying, what about the treasury of the Topkapi Palace in Istanbul? And you would be right. But it is the only one, it is the only royal treasury in the Muslim world that remains intact. All other royal treasuries have been dispersed, either raided, looted, or sacked by conquering armies. Fatimid Cairo was sacked by Salahuddin in 1171, its palaces pulled down and its treasury dispersed. Abbasid Baghdad was destroyed by the Mongols in 1258 and its libraries and treasures were destroyed with, with the city. The great cities of the Mamluk Empire, Cairo, Alexandria, Damascus, were conquered by the Ottomans between 1516 and 1517 and their treasure was carried back to Istanbul. The Ottomans also raided into Iran and sacked the Safavid treasury in Tabriz. And the greatest treasure house of all, of the Mughal emperors in Delhi, was ransacked by the Afghan warlord Nader Shah in 1738. Now, the booty from the Mughal treasury was so vast that it took 700 elephants, 4,000 camels, and 12,000 horses to transport it back to Iran. Some of it can still be seen in Tehran today, including the famous peacock throne of Shah Jahan, but much of it was gifted by Nader Shah to Catherine the Great of Russia and is on view in the Hermitage in St. Petersburg Museum today. Historically, up until the 18th century, only a small part of the vast treasure of the Muslim world found its way to Europe. The great museum collections that you see in the West today were built up in the, the 19th and 20th centuries, due largely to the efforts of wealthy individuals who were motivated to invest huge amounts of time, money, and effort to building private collections, which they then bequeathed in perpetuity to national institutions, or in some cases, private foundations which carry their name. And I'm talking about the Gulbenkian Museum in Lisbon, this is Mr. Gulbenkian, the Banaki Museum in Athens, the Chester Beatty Library in Dublin, and the Doris Duke Foundation in Honolulu. These are just some of the treasure houses of Islamic art in the West today, built through the generosity and vision of a handful of private cultured individuals. I will speak of each of these individuals in detail later on, but first I want to wind the clock back and ask, what happened before the 19th century. What evidence is there for Islamic art in Christian Europe, in, for instance, the Middle Ages, and during the Renaissance, in Italy and Northern Europe? What objects traveled, and what impact did those objects have on taste and design and interior decor in Europe? How were those Islamic art objects perceived at the time, and where are they now? And I'm now going to teleport you back almost a thousand years to the period of the Crusades, where our story begins. And I'm calling this section the 
collecting of trophies and souvenirs. The period of the Crusader occupation of the Middle East began in 1095 with the First Crusade. It lasted almost 200 years, spanning a geographical area which approximates to the modern states of Israel, Lebanon, Jordan, and Syria. In that time, the mainly Frankish or French Crusaders captured, lost, and recaptured Jerusalem and built a number of spectacular and structurally ingenious fortresses, many of which stand in remarkable condition today. And I show you just one, which is Crac de Chevalier near Homs in Syria, close to where I was excavating in the 1990s. This castle was described by Lawrence of Arabia as the most beautiful castle in the world. The military successes of the Crusaders produced some fine art trophies which were to find their way, back, their way back into church treasuries in Europe where they remain to this day. These included beautiful carved rock crystal vessels from the court of the Muslim rulers of Egypt, the Fatimids. This example is a ewer carved with rams. It's difficult to see, but the design has a pair of rams on it. Um, with arabesques. It, it dates to the 10th century, and it's been dressed up in Europe upon its arrival with silver gilt mounts, probably done in Venice. There are a total of seven rock crystal ewers of this type from the Fatimid period. Two are in the treasury of San Marco in Venice. There's this one and this second example. One is in the Bargello in Florence. One is in the treasury of Fermo Cathedral, so there are four in Italy. One is in the treasury of Saint-Denis in Paris, on loan to the Louvre, and two are in the Louvre, one in the v &A and another in a private collection. They are, if you like, the holy grail for any collector of Islamic art. Other precious objects surviving in medieval church treasuries were probably acquired legitimately by pilgrims visiting the Holy Land and returning with souvenirs. For instance here, a Mamluk glass pilgrim bottle from the treasury of the Cathedral of San Stefan in Vienna. And here a pilgrim flask in the British Museum. Both of these were produced in Syria in the mid 13th century and were probably used as containers for holy water or sanctified earth brought back from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem by some pious Christian pilgrim. Another famous Islamic object with a putative crusader provenance is the celebrated baptistère of Saint Louis. Now in the Louvre in Paris, for many years this magnificent gold and silver inlaid basin was used as a baptismal font by the French royal family. It is ironic to think that the Dauphin, the heir to the French crown, was baptized into the Christian faith using a Muslim vessel. The baptistère was reportedly brought back by King Louis of France on the crusade of 1169. But since the object actually dates to a period 100 years later than that, um, it's probably unlikely in the story is mythology. Nonetheless, it is a good example of the mythologizing tendencies of the crusader period, a period that brought massive civilian and military casualties and ended with the total retreat of the Christian forces and the reestablishment of Muslim sovereignty over the entire Middle East. So we've looked at a few soldiers and pilgrims, now the merchants. Another luxury item that was brought to Europe from the Middle East and was to form the core of a number of early collections of Islamic art was the luxury knotted carpet. When we start to look at carpets, we strike a rich vein up until now, we've seen just smatterings, a few odds and ends picked up by pilgrims or purloined by crusaders. But now when we look at carpets, we see a wholesale commercial demand for luxury items. The tradition of the knotted carpet is one that long predates Islam. But in the 15th century in Europe, there was a raised awareness of the Middle Eastern carpet due to increased trade and a taste for luxury and modernity. European courts. There was also widespread recognition that Muslim craftsmen were superior in this art. Just as the Chinese produced better pottery, so the best carpets came from Turkey and Iran. Venice provided the main channel for this trade, 
And in this painting by the circle of Bellini in the Louvre, you can see Venetian, a Venetian delegation here, these gentlemen dressed in black, who are standing at the gates of the city of Damascus. Um, they're being greeted by the Mamluk governor of the city, who has this very splendid turban. And the city is instantly recognizable uh, by the, the mosque. I'm trying to get this pointer to work. Not to worry. But you can see the domed building in the background, which is the the dome which um, is over the prayer hall of the great mosque in Damascus. And to the right is the distinctive Mamluk minaret, which still stands today. Once transported to Venice, carpets were bought and shipped on to northern Europe and were sometimes passed on as diplomatic gifts, but also traded for huge sums of money. Their presence in Europe is attested both by written documents, but also by their, their appearance in Italian and Flemish paintings. In this painting by Domenico Ghirlandaio of the enthroned Madonna, you can see that the Madonna and child are shown on a throne with, at her feet, um, a very distinctive Turkish knotted carpet. The same can be seen in this rendering of the same scene by Jan van Eyck, who's a Flemish artist, um, again, very clearly a Turkish carpet, um, which the artist has um, probably had in his studio and used as a prop for the painting. And this is another Flemish artist, Hans Memling, a painting in the Uffizi, which shows the Madonna and Child again resting on this distinctive Turkish carpet. My personal favorite, this painting by Hans Memling, which was formerly in the collection of Baron Tissen and is now in the Tissen Museum in Madrid. And it's a sort of an iconic portrait of the Virgin. The Virgin's presence signified by the lilies, um, signaling her virginity, and this sort of mystical space with the jug, um, with the um, crucifixion of Christ is alluded to on the jug. And you can see the jug is placed on a, a Turkish carpet. And this kind of carpet, which only survives in fragments, is known today as a Memling carpet because it's recorded in Memling's paintings. Other Renaissance artists who exploited the exotic beauty of Turkish carpets in their paintings are Lorenzo Lotto and Hans Holbein the Younger, both portrait painters who pose their sitters on or against or in front of carpets. Here we see a portrait by Hans Holbein of the merchant Georg Gizza from 1532. The portrayal of a merchant surrounded by worldly goods is a measure of the importance that representatives of trade had achieved in the maritime nations of Europe. But the greatest collectors of carpets during the Renaissance were European royalty. And the most magnificent collection of carpets in 16th century Europe belonged to Henry VIII of England, he of the six wives. His inventories contain over 400 entries which refer to carpets of turkey making. His daughter, Queen Elizabeth I, does not to appear to have taken a special interest, but her successor, James I, who is shown here in this painting, he's shown um, in the front right, King James I of England, during his reign, we see a second major vogue for Turkish carpets. It is notable that at this time, these luxury items were generally placed on tables rather than floors because they were considered too valuable to be trodden upon. With their characteristic brilliant reds and golds offset by a dark ground and their powerful geometric patterns and bold stylizations, these carpets must have acted as a dramatic visual counterpoint to the three-dimensional sculpture and painting that was standard decor at a Renaissance court. So we see at a critical phase in the formation of the visual arts in Europe, the claims of Islamic art began to make themselves felt alongside Chinese porcelains and other exotic items. Here you see in this Dutch still life, a porcelain jar, a Turkish carpet, and a South American parrot, which I'm afraid has been executed, has had its head cut off, but at the top you can just see the bright yellow and blue parrot. 
all of these items considered to be exotic luxuries brought from faraway lands. Another major Turkish product that was making itself known in Europe in the 16th century was Iznik pottery. The presence of European precious metal mounts on Iznik pieces in European collections points to its growing reputation as an exotic collectible. This is a jug in the British Museum which was made in about 1585 and 10 years later it, it had reached England and it's been given these lavish silver gilt mounts which are hallmarked 1597. Collecting Exotica. The 16th century was a period when European curiosity about Asia was entering a new phase, the great age of exploration and discovery. In 1497, the Portuguese navigator Vasco da Gama became the first man to sail around the Cape of Good Hope, opening up the possibility of direct sea trade between Europe, India, and China. The Portuguese were the first to exploit these new eastward routes, but the Dutch, the French, and the English followed soon after. We see now Asian luxuries spilling into Europe and taking center stage in European princely collections. These 16th century mother of pearl objects were produced by Muslim craftsmen in Gujarat in India and were carried on Portuguese ships back to Europe where they were sumptuously embellished with elaborate gold and silver gilt mounts. This Euron basin is now in the Grunus Gewölbe in Dresden and was formerly in the treasury of the electors of Saxony. The Nuremberg Mounts date to before 1530. Just like Turkish carpets, Indo-Islamic mother-of-pearl articles are listed in many 16th century European royal inventories. We know, for example, that in 1534, Thomas Cromwell presented Henry VIII of England with a mother-of-pearl ewer set as a New Year's Eve present. The formation of the East India Company by Queen Elizabeth I of England in 1600 provided merchants and adventurers with a means and an incentive to make their fortunes overseas. This was not without its dangers. The hazards of traveling in exotic lands is evoked in the title of a contemporary book published by a Scotsman, which is called Rare Adventures and Painful Peregrinations. It was obviously extremely uncomfortable and dangerous to travel at this time. If you survived the voyage, you were lucky if you then didn't catch malaria. And if you visit cemeteries in South Asia, you'll find most um, European travelers uh, didn't make it beyond their 30th birthday. European merchants begin to appear in miniature paintings at the Muslim court in Mughal, India. Their curious costumes and strange habits, such as sitting on chairs, and keeping dogs and cats as pets are carefully observed and recorded by Muslim artists. You can see the European gentleman sitting in a chair, which was very unusual for Mughal audience, and there are, there's a cat at his feet. The first visitors to the court of the great Mughal were the Catholic Jesuit missionaries from Portugal. Here, hiding behind the elephant, dressed in black, is a po-faced Portuguese priest who has been dispatched from Goa to try to convert the Mughal emperor to Christianity. The hopes of the Portuguese were no doubt raised when paintings of the Virgin Mary, which they presented to the emperor as presents, were hung up prom prominently on the walls of his imperial chamber. And those of you who have sharp eyes can actually see there is a painting of the Virgin Mary above the emperor Jahangir's head between the two white columns at the very top. You can see her white face. The dispersal of the treasures of the Mughal court had already begun in the mid 17th century. Many of them finding their way back into European collections. Some of the more remarkable examples of this are the group of Mughal miniatures including portraits of the Emperor Shah Jahan that are recorded in the collection of the Dutch artist Rembrandt. In 1656, an inventory of Rembrandt's possessions lists an album of curious miniature drawings. We now know that these were, this was a dispersed Mughal album from Delhi 
The fascination that these paintings held for the artist is witnessed in the pen and ink copies that he made after them. It was clearly their linear rather than their coloristic qualities that interested the Dutch artist. Rembrandt is also known to have collected Islamic costumes and metalwork. Incidentally, some of the Mughal miniatures belonging to Rembrandt were later acquired by the Habsburg Empress Mary Therese of Austria, and she had them set into the Rococo paneling of her palace at Schoenbrunn in Vienna. English private and public collections are especially rich in Mughal material, which is scarcely surprising given British colonial history. It was colonial expansion into the Muslim world that really stimulated the collecting of Islamic art. There is no better example of this than the so-called Clive of India treasure that was sold at auction in London in 2004. Robert Clive, first Baron Clive of Plassey, popularly known as Clive of India, is widely acknowledged to have been the founder of the British Empire in India. At the Battle of Plassey in 1757, Clive won a, a victory over the combined Indian and French armies, despite being vastly outnumbered in terms of soldiery and weaponry. Eight years later, at the Treaty of Allahabad, the Mughal Emperor signed away much of his empire and opened the way to British dominion over the Indian subcontinent. Clive's place in the annals of British history was secured, and he returned to London considerably enriched. His personal fortune calculated at 400,000 pounds, which in the 18th century was a stupendous sum of money. The Clive treasure was to form the basis of one of Europe's first substantial collections of Indo-Islamic art, held mostly today at Powys Castle in Wales. It even includes a suit of elephant armor, which is now in the Royal Armouries in Leeds. All of these were acquired as military trophies, proof of victory in the spoils of war. This jade bottle, which stands 10 inches high, is made out of pieces of shaped pale green nephrite jade, inset and inlaid in gold with rubies and emeralds. The fly whisk, shown here, is also 10 inches and is constructed of pieces of banded agate on a central metal core with a collar of emeralds and rubies. The fly whisk was estimated to fetch five to 8,000 pounds in the sale. After 20 minute bidding, ba uh, bidding battle, it sold for 800,000 pounds, 100 times its estimate. The bottle did even better and sold for 2.6 million pounds. These are both in the Museum of Islamic Art in Qatar today. I should say that not all Islamic art in English collections is stolen. Most of the collecting was done by enthusiastic amateurs as light relief from their tedious administrative duties. As these aristocratic English families fall on hard times and sell off their precious heirlooms, artworks are redistributed to new owners, principally in North America and the Middle East. There's another important treasury in India at this time, not just the Mughal treasury, and that is the treasury of Tipu Sultan, the ruler of Mysore in the south. His great military opponent was this man, Arthur Wellesley, better known as the Duke of Wellington another great British military hero who began his public career serving for the army of the East India Company in India. As a young man, he was one of the officers who led the assault on the fortress of the Muslim hero Tipu Sultan at Seringapatam in 1799. This painting shows Tipu, Tipu's last stand, if you like. He's about to be killed, and here is a scene after he's been slain, this is the body of Tipu and the General Harris, General Harris standing over him. Tipu's personal insignia was the tiger. All his possessions, including his famous gold throne, and here he's, he's shown seated upon his gold throne, all his clothes, all his jewelry, all his weapons were adorned with images of tigers or tiger stripes. It is clear that Tipu personally associated with the tiger, and he is quoted as saying, better to live one day as a tiger than a lifetime as a sheep. Trophies taken at the siege of Seringapatam helped form the basis of the royal collection of oriental arms at Windsor Castle, as well as the royal armories at Leeds 
and the South Kensington Museum, known today as the V&A. This throne was cut up by the British army officers and distributed, pieces of it distributed, as payment to the soldiers, to the officers who'd taken part in the siege. This sounds very brutal and barbaric, but it was actually part of the standard rules of engagement and rules of war at the time, to the victor, the spoils. The, the tiger head, which you see here, at the front of the throne, is now in Windsor Castle. It actually sits on the table in the main banqueting hall at Windsor Castle. And if any of you are ever invited by the king uh, to dinner at Windsor, you might actually get to see the tiger. Um, it's made of solid gold. It's a life-size figure. And the teeth, you can just make them out, the sharp teeth are made of rock crystal. This is one of the little finials from around the throne. There were eight of them in total. And this one's been set onto a sword, mounted as a grip on a sword. This is Tipu's sporting gun, which is carved in the form of a tiger. This is a cannon, which was sold at Sotheby's in 2006, is now in the Al Sabah collection in Kuwait. You can see the end of the cannon has the distinctive tiger head. This is Tipu's tent in Powys Castle in Wales. And this is Tipu's tiger, one of the treasures of the Victorian Albert Museum. Um, it's over life size. It was made, we know, by a French engineer who was at Tipu's court. Uh, Tipu had heard that one of his great enemies um, who, had, he defeat, who had defeated him in battle, he heard that his son had arrived in India and was part of the British Army, and he was sitting at the banks of a river having a picnic when a tiger sprung out of the jungle and jumped onto this poor young man, young Monroe, and savaged him to death. When Tipu was told of this, apparently he was so delighted that he commissioned this sculpture because of his great, his arch rival's son had been um, mauled and killed by the tiger. It's, um, the, 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 the object opens up and it has a keyboard inside. It's actually, um, it's an organ, and you wind it up, and the tiger growls, and the Englishman screams. It's in the Victorian Albert Museum, if you want to go and see it. By the 19th century, collecting was following two strands. On the one hand, the fashionable romantic collecting that has its counterpart in Orientalist architectural fantasies and interior designs. And this is epitomized by the fantasy palace built by George IV, then the Prince Regent at Brighton on the south coast. This is actually by the sea, British English seaside, can you believe it, um, and stands in a public park today. It's open to the public. And it was where the Prince Regent, future George IV, used to go at the weekend to take the fresh sea air and to relax away from the court in London. Well, no prizes for guessing the inspiration for this building. There was also a serious side to collecting and study associated with the Age of Enlightenment and the fact-finding mission of scholar collectors. That this serious trend is captured in this building, which is the Arab Hall at Leighton House in West London. The residence of the pre-Raphaelite artist, Frederick Lord Leighton, this stunning interior, which is open to the public, incorporates real 16th and 17th century Syrian tile work that Leighton had bought in Damascus when he was traveling in Syria in the 1870s. Leighton went on to buy more tiles from a man called Caspar Purden Clark, who was also in Damascus at the time, buying Islamic art on behalf of the Victorian Albert Museum. The quickening of first-hand study and the encyclopedic collecting of amateurs and scholars alike was to drive the great museum collections of the 20th century. The Victorian age was an age obsessed with ornament, and Islamic design, with its endlessly fascinating variety of patterns, offered inspiration to writers, artists, and collectors alike. 
in the early 20th century, strong relationships developed between museums and collectors, and these were really taken for granted. Collectors donated works and endowed galleries. One such collector was the Englishman Frederick Ducan Godman, who was unrelenting in his pursuit of high-quality Iznik ceramics from Turkey, as well as examples of lusterware from Spain and Iran. The sums paid for these objects at the time were very high indeed, even by today's standards. I think it's interesting to consider that Godman was a lepidopterist. Does anyone know what a lepidopterist is? A lepidopterist is a person who studies and collects butterflies. So he was obviously very interested in beautiful insects, and I think some of the, the sort of surface pattern that you see in Iznik and other Islamic designs is reminiscent of the, of the patterns you see on the wings of butterflies. Godman left his collection to his two daughters. Oh, this is a personal favorite of mine. I call this the Marilyn Monroe or Bette Midler lips design. It's actually a stylized tiger stripe, and the little balls are supposedly leopard spots. Um, the Godman sisters proved extremely long-lived. The British Museum had to wait over 50 years until the Godman collection finally came into the galleries in 1983. It numbers over 200 pieces, and it's the largest collection of Iznik pottery in the world. The early 20th century was the period of the great collectors, true connoisseurs who were knowledgeable and mad for art. Instinctively acquisitive, they bought on a scale that would be near impossible with today's prices and dangerous with today's import and export regulations. Most of them would probably be in prison today. Their insatiable appetite was fed by the flow of goods to the market. The Armenian collector, Kalust Gulbenkian, a pioneer of the international oil industry, formed a vast collection totaling some 5,000 works of art from Egyptian antiquities, Renaissance old masters to impressionists, contemporary jewelry by René Lalique, and Islamic ceramics and textiles. At the museum in Lisbon, Portugal, that houses his collection, Persian knotted carpets are given equal prominence, displayed alongside masterpieces by Rembrandt and Monet. His collection of Iznik is second in size and importance only to the Godman collection, the British Museum. The acquisitions of Godman and Gulbenkian were made possible by the almost simultaneous collapse of the Qajar and Ottoman dynasties, which brought many rare Arabic and Persian and Turkish artworks onto the market. The invention of the steam engine and the extension of European the, the European rail system through Turkey to Iran facilitated the transportation of people and goods to and from hitherto remote places. The next collector we come to is Sir Arthur Chester Beatty. He was an, um, an American by birth. He settled in London in 1911, and began to build a collection of medieval manuscripts funded by his interests in the mining industry. A honeymoon with his second wife in Egypt awakened a curiosity for Islamic manuscripts, which was later to expand to include Chinese and Japanese manuscripts. Beatty was an intuitive connoisseur who bought from the heart. He also had an exceptional eye buying impulsively and brilliantly. Conscious of his Irish ancestry, after the end of World War II, Chester Beatty moved to Dublin, and in 1968, he left his house and library to the people of Ireland. His collection of Arabic manuscripts and Persian and Mughal miniatures is one of the most outstanding in the world and includes such rare treasures as the thousand-year-old Quran of Ibn al-Bawab, the earliest surviving Quran manuscript written in Nashk, or cursive script. The Chester Beatty collection is now housed in Dublin Castle and is open to the general public. I would urge you to visit. Another collector who was an exact contemporary of Chester Beatty was Anthony Benaki. Benaki was a Greek cotton merchant living in Alexandria in Egypt. He was inspired by a fascination with Islam's role in the Mediterranean, and especially its links with the Greco-Roman and Byzantine worlds. He was part of a wealthy Greek community based in Alexandria, 
who were eventually uprooted and displaced by the rise of Arab nationalism in the 1950s. Upon his death in 1954, he donated his collection to the Greek nation, where it is housed in the Banakis family mansion in downtown Athens. In 2004, a separate building was opened to showcase the substantial Islamic collection, which includes everything from the earliest years of Arab expansion right up to the 19th century. The collection focuses on decorative arts. Unlike Chester Beatty, Banakis did not collect manuscripts or miniatures. It's a, his collection is especially strong in woodwork, ceramics, glass, metalwork, textiles, and jewelry. And the Banaki Museum was, of course, is, of course, a major lender to the Islamic Biennale. Another important collector is Christian Ludwig David. David was a successful Danish lawyer who initi initially built up a collection of European paintings but went on to acquire a small number of Islamic carpets and ceramics. In 1945, he set up the David Foundation with a substantial endowment which helps to manage the David family ancestral house in Copenhagen, where the collection is housed. The David collection is unique amongst the small museums we've been looking at, as it has continued to evolve in the 65-year period since its founder died. The directors and trustees realized early on that in order to be relevant to a wider audience, they needed to fill a gap in the cultural landscape or risk becoming just another small museum of European art. Their policy has been radical and visionary. In the past half century, the acquisition policy of this Danish museum has focused exclusively on Islamic art, and the collection has grown from 266 Islamic objects in 1960 to over 2,500 pieces today. As the collection has expanded, so has the need for more gallery space, and in 1986, the foundation acquired the neighboring townhouse overlooking Copenhagen's famous Rosenberg Gardens. In 2009, after an extensive refurbishment, the museum reopened with a stunning sequence of new galleries with dramatic fiber optic lighting and state-of-the-art interactive display. Even with all the other new Islamic galleries around the world, the David Collection is, in my view, the finest. It sets the gold standard and is the best place to view classical Islamic art in Europe today. The present director of the museum, Dr. Kelvon Fulsak, who was here last month, for the opening, the Biennale, has shown not only an exceptionally fine eye, but also a capacity to skillfully navigate the market and root out such masterpieces as the stunning ivory casket made in 10th century Cordova that was acquired for the museum in 2002. There are many other eminent collectors of Islamic art far too many to mention, so I've chosen to concentrate on the few who have either been instrumental in building up institutions or whose collections have been enshrined in public museums. The art market today, the movers and shakers. Please excuse the dreadful pun. On the contemporary scene, Sir Nasser David Khalili in London, Sheikh Nasser and Sheikh Hussar al Sabar in Kuwait, the Altani family in Qatar, and His Highness the Aga Khan are the big movers and shakers. So Nasser David Khalili has a collection of over 25,000 pieces, of which approximately 10,000 are coins and seals. The remaining 15,000 pieces cover all artistic media from Qurans, manuscripts, arts of the book, textiles, carpets, jewelry, and a full range of three-dimensional objects in ceramic, metal, glass, stone, and a variety of other pressure materials precious materials. It offers a comprehensive representation of the material culture of the Islamic world. The collection is the outcome of over 40 years of collecting and 30 years of research, conservation, and publication. There are 27 volumes of catalogues, and they have become an indispensable reference work, which together form the ultimate encyclopedia of Islamic art. The collection includes major objects, some of which have no parallel in any museum. Two of the greatest treasures of the Quran, copied in Baghdad in 1282 by the celebrated calligrapher Yakut al Mustasimi, and the Jami al Tabarikh, which I show you here, or Compendium of Chronicles, produced in Tabriz in 1314, one of the most important illustrated manuscripts ever produced, which was acquired at Sotheby's in 1982. 
Sheikh Nasser and Sheikh Ohusa al Sabah. Sheikh Nasser and Sheikh Ohusa began collecting in 1975 with their first purchase, a Mamluk enameled glass bottle, which you can see in Gallery 5 of the Biennale. Their aim was to reclaim their Islamic heritage. Within eight years, they had acquired over 2,000, sorry, 20,000 pieces at a time when rare and important Islamic works of art were still readily available in the market. In 1983, their museum, the Dar al al-Islamiya, opened to great fanfare and began to attract the attention of scholars and curators from around the world. Unfortunately, it also attracted the attention of Saddam Hussein, and in 1981, the museum became one of the first casualties of the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait and was systematically looted of its priceless contents. That, that is the same space after the Iraqi army set fire to the building. What couldn't be removed from the museum was torched by the invading troops, including this pair of 14th century carved wooden doors from Fez, which were incinerated in the inferno. After the war, most of the artworks were recovered by a team from UNESCO, but some 60 items remain unaccounted for, including this 234 carat mogul carved emerald. So if any of you see this next time you're out shopping, you know that it's, it actually belongs to Sheikh Hussa. Um, of course, this piece is so well known that it, it'll never appear again. So it's either in a Swiss bank vault or it's been recarved. There was a rumor that Saddam Hussein's son Uday had taken it and had um, buried it in a vault in Zurich or somewhere. Sadly, Sheikh Nasser died in 2020, and his wife, Sheikh Ohusa, continues to execute on the vision of the museum as a center for scholarship, training, and conservation. The other Gulf royal family that has been an active player in the Islamic art market over the past 25 years is the Altani family of Qatar. First, the brothers, Sheikh Hassan and Sheikh Saud, and then their successor as Minister of Culture, Her Excellency Sheikha al Mayasa. Their entry into the auction market in the 1990s led to some famous gladiatorial spas with Sheikh Nasser and other collectors, which drove prices up to record levels. The collection is housed in this building. Designed by Pritzker Prize winning architect I.M. Pei, the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha rises from the sea on an artificial island and is inspired by the 13th century Sabil, or ablutions fountain, of the Mosque of Ahmed ibn Tulun in Cairo. A terrace on the northeast side offers panoramic views of the Gulf and the West Bay area. The galleries, designed by Jean-Michel Vilmot, who also collaborated with I.M. Pei on the glass pyramid of the Louvre in Paris, contain such masterpieces as this timurid chessboard garden carpet from Central Asia, probably Samarkand, 14th, 15th century, which is almost four meters in length. Um, this was actually discovered in a monastery in Tibet, can you believe that? Um, where it had been preserved at high altitude in the very dry, very arid environment of the Tibetan high plateau. It's one of the earliest carpets in the world. This is a Nishapur or Samarkand dish from the 10th century with a distinctive Kufic inscription, concentric disc uh, inscription, not dissimilar to a piece in the Al Sabah collection, which you can see in Gallery 5. This is a, a wheel cut glass ewer from Iran, 10th century, 1,000 year old piece of glass that survives intact miraculously. This was sold at Sotheby's in 2003 for 621,000 pounds. Um, this is a famous, very important candlestick made for the Injuid ruler of Shiraz, Abu Ishaq. Um, it has his name on it, the name of the craftsman, Saad ibn Abdullah, and it dates to the 1340s, 1350s. And it came originally from the collection of Jasim Humezi, a Kuwaiti collector, collector who found it in a marketplace in Yemen. It was, actually being, it was actually turned upside down, covered in soot, and was been, being used as a brazier to, to, to brew coffee. Um, it was missing its socket, and some weeks later, um, Sheikh 
uh, sorry, um, Jassim Hamezi was contacted um, by somebody, one of his scouts in Yemen, saying, we found the socket. And the, the socket and the base were reunited, it was cleaned, and it's one of the most important medieval Islamic manuscripts that survive. So that's an indication of just how um, constructive and um, how important the role is of collectors in, in preservation, conservation, and publication of Islamic objects. Um, and finally, this is um, a pen case made for the Ilkhanid vizier, Shamsadi Muhammad Juvaini, in Western Iran in the 13th century. This was sold at Sotheby's in April 2003 for 1.1 million pounds. And this was discovered in Portobello Market. So keep your eyes peeled. We see in Qatar how museum culture can be used to define the identity of a young nation. How the power of culture can be harnessed to the culture of power following the model of the great European and American museums of the last century. What is more unusual is when a community aspires to the same outcome, and that is the case with the Ismaili community under the leadership of His Highness the Aga Khan. The Aga Khan Foundation is well known for its engagement with the conservation and preservation of Islamic heritage, principally in the field of architecture. But in the late 90s and noughties, His Highness began to collect Islamic art on a grand scale, a collection which was unveiled in a new museum in Toronto, which opened in October 2014. The collection showcases 1,300 years of Islamic history and is particularly strong in miniatures and the arts of the book. Amongst the treasures of the museum is this illustrated page from the Shahnameh of Shah Tamasp from 1525, sold at Sotheby's in London in April 2011 for 7.4 million pounds, a world record for an Islamic work on paper at the time. Since then, the record has been broken by another miniature from this manuscript, sold at Sotheby's in October last year for 8.1 million pounds. And we actually have a third miniature from the manuscript, which is coming up for auction in London on the 26th of April. And we're hoping maybe the record will be broken for a third time. I want to end my talk today with a very little known, but nonetheless important collector of Islamic art called Doris Duke. Well, some of you may have heard of Doris Duke. Her father founded Duke University in America, and as his sole heir, Doris inherited a vast fortune, which she spent in, on a wide range of philanthropic causes. She was especially interested in contemporary dance and Islamic art. In her day, she was known as the richest woman in America. I thought it was appropriate to end with Doris Duke, as her interest in Islamic art brings together many of the strands of collecting that I've been talking about with the exception of pillage and plunder, which was the reserve of the British imperialists. Doris Duke's love affair with Islamic art seems to have begun on her honeymoon in the 1930s. Her honeymoon was a glorious occasion, a three-year round-the-world trip that took her through India and Iran and ended up in Honolulu, of all places, in Hawaii. In Honolulu, Doris Duke built for herself a fantasy palace called Shangri-La, which still stands untouched as it was on the day she died in 1993, and is open as a public museum. Dor Doris Duke was both the romantic, looking from afar, and the enthusiastic amateur who traveled and became increasingly knowledgeable. Guided by her mentor, Arthur Appen Pope, who published the great survey of Persian art, Duke built up a collection of over 3,500 objects, some of world-class importance, and you can see some of them in these rather blurry slides including the famous mihrab. If I can get the pointer to work, which I can't, but in, through the, you can see there's a pair of Moroccan doors, similar to the ones that were incinerated in the Kuwait Museum, and beyond that, in a, in a further room, you can glimpse uh, a mihrab. You can see its distinctive arch form. This is an, an entire um, 13th, early 14th century mihrab, um, which she acquired um, from the Rabanu family, who at that time were um, selling Iranian artifacts into the market. She also collected ceramics, um, arms and armor, metalwork, and in this room you see a complete um, Spanish carved and coffered ceiling. <coughs> 
The house is spectacular. She has two Damascus paneled and painted rooms. I'll show you just one of them here. There's inlay marble work done by craftsmen from Damascus. Um, she also brought craftsmen from, from India um, to do the Pietro Dura work in her bathroom. You can see the mashrabiya or jali screens of pierced marble which were carved in situ and the, um, the, the floral designs which are all inlaid in colored hard stones. And this is her bedroom, which is a sort of Mughal fantasy. You step out into the garden, and there are water courses with marble fountains. Uh, there's a chark bar. There's a traditional Persian paradise garden laid out. And it leads you down through terraces to the sea. Um, she was an Olympic swimmer, Doris Duke. And she was a great surfer. And she used to hang out with all the surfers on the beach. Um, and this is, you see, this is Diamond Point, just outside Honolulu. And her, the changing room for her swimming pool is, is um, modeled on the Chihil Satun, which is a royal pavilion in the Maidan in Isfahan in Iran. So she's borrowing from different sources, but you know, creating what is a sensuous ensemble. Islamic art clearly appealed to a certain side of Duke's personality. With its intimate spaces and sensual lines, it is a style for private as well as public occasions. It offers a vision of beauty as well as an escape route out of convention, an antidote to the familiar for Western collectors reacting to the conventions and constrictions of their own society. It obviously appealed to an irrepressible side of Duke's personality. Perhaps it just allowed her to be herself what Duke learned was that Islamic art is endlessly fascinating and breathtakingly beautiful and has the, the ability to touch one directly and deeply. It also provides an opportunity to learn more about one of the world's great civilizations. And never has that been more pressing and important than today in these fractured and uncertain times. Thank you.